Morning, Cap. Good morning, John. Uh, let's see. So the way that I always like to start things off with you is discuss your golf game. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's been all right, actually. It's been all right. Um, me and uh, one of us, buddy. Me and a buddy are in the quarterfinals of uh, like this uh, tournament at the at the club, and so uh, we're playing on Sunday. So we'll see. Uh, so what kind of, is this obviously best ball pairs or, or what are we doing here and what's at stake? Do you get like a shiny trophy? Is it, is it like the, uh, is it like the supporters shield captain America pie plate? What, what do we have here? Good question. I haven't a clue. Um, <laughs> no idea, honestly, first time I've ever played in it. So just along for the ride, just <clears throat> upsetting people because I keep playing well with my like 15 handicap. <laughs> Uh, are you sure that you're a 15 handicap, sir? So the numbers tell me. There you go. See, that's it. It's like you have to go with the math. The math says I'm a 15. Therefore, I'm a 15. And everybody sits there and goes, how did you do that? Well, hey, I, I got lucky, I guess. It's just how this is going, man. I, it, my game's coming together. It's all that playing consistently. It's all. I, I know how the sound bites are supposed to go in the clubhouse. I know how this rolled. Exactly. Uh, Rhode Island FC. Some of the draws are turning into wins, and uh, I think it's 10 draws right now on the season so far, and I know that that drives you nuts, but you're getting some draws turning into wins, and you had a great result the other night where you were down 3-1 and came back to get a point with a 3-3 draw. Well done on that regard. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the past couple of weeks have been uh, really good. We had two wins in a row, including a big one at Louisville where uh, – they were undefeated and we went and put five on them um, at their place, which is crazy. Um, we played really well and then uh, followed that one up with another win. And um, yeah, a good tie. Uh, this was one of those good ties for sure um, this past weekend, and which was really good because it was a home game. We had fireworks. It was a big crowd. So um, it, was, it was a really good uh, response from the, the team to get back there and tie. What's it been like to see things grow and evolve in this season where you might drift in occasionally, see what's going on from the from the from the club level? You sit there in the owner's box, you know, whenever you can catch up with them or you go and find a road game. What's it been like to see this finally come to fruition on the field and then have those moments up in Rhode Island where they're they're hitting the final spikes on, on these edges in the construction? What's it been like for you to see all this stuff come to the fore? Yeah, it's pretty cool just to see it all come together and how long everything takes. And just to think, you know, I remember when we were having discussions, we hadn't even signed a player yet. And it's like, God, where do, where are we going to find everyone? And how, how are you going to put a team together? And <clears throat> so going into year two, I think it'll be so much more easier starting from a base, um, you know, and, and we like a lot of guys on the team. So <clears throat> We won't have to be finding 20 players, that's for sure. But just really cool to see everything evolve. Um, you know, it's some of the behind the scenes conversations and things. You're like, man, if this or that went the other way, I'm not sure we'd be here today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's 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 been it's been <laughs> fun to see something grow from the ground up, and you end up with. All of these different ideas of, okay, this is what we'd like for the franchise to be. And knowing you and knowing how competitive you are as an individual, I know you're like, it's like, you know, we got to, I want us to win. I want us to win championships. We got to chase after Lou City. We've got to chase after, you know, Charleston and everybody in the East. And we've got to make inroads. And, but it's, you know, being a first year team, it's a tough slog. I mean, what have you learned about yourself in this whole venture that you didn't know about yourself, either as, a, a player looking at other players or someone who's a, a part of a, a, a group that wants something to succeed. Have you learned anything about yourself? Yeah, just how important, you know, patience and perspective is, you know, it's so easy to judge from the outside um, of decisions and lineups and subs and how you would do it versus how it's going. And then, you know, with results and things like that. And, you know, I think that I'm pretty level headed, but, you know, there's, there's other guys, uh, other people involved and, you know, just trying to tell them, Hey, 
it'll be all right. Like things, things will be fine. And having patience in that regard, because uh, you're right, it does take time. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Some of the conversations I have with Kano and, um, you know, with him being GM and head coach and things you have to deal with, you know, on and off the field. And it's just, there's a lot. And um, it's not just kicking soccer balls that, you know, you have to be concerned about. There's there's other stuff too. So, um, you know, seeing the whole picture and understanding those types of things. And um, that's that's been really cool for me to kind of experience and witness and grow. So when you have conversations with mentees about patience and perspective, do they get it? Do they, or, or, you know, because we all know how we were when we were young, we were, you know, slamming to fifth gear. Let's go, let's go, let's go. You know, I want to, I want to be at the top of the mountain. I want to be the best there is the best there was and the best there ever will be to paraphrase from Bret Hart, you know, but it, it takes time sometimes for, folks to get to where they want to be but the impatience of youth sometimes gets in the way of our own successes when you talk to mentees do they have patience and perspective yet are you helping them in that process Uh, are they teaching you things when it comes to those two what do patience and perspective mean to mentees yeah i think it's difficult you know it's difficult for younger players to to see the bigger picture and to understand that there's a journey and things you have to go through in order to have success. And, um, you know, some of those things are down periods and poor moments and, uh, adversity. Um, but that's, that's difficult, right? You you don't want to lose games. You don't want to play poorly. Um, that's never the goal and it's tough in the moment to see how can you learn from that and what can you take from it and why it's important to go through these things. Um, so, and, and I also think it's difficult for them to understand, when I say that like off the field and like I was speaking to someone the other day, who's going to like a regional camp ish. And I was telling him that, you know, you can't always control every touch you take, right. It's, you're going to take some bad touches, but make sure that you do control the things you can, like your attitude, your work, right. Look a coach in the eye, be run when they call you in, right. Be a good teammate, communicate, um, you know, and by communicate, I mean, just, hey, good pass. Hey, good try. This, that, right? Being positive and how far that goes. Um, I r- truly think that players underestimate those things um, and how important they are and that um, they really can be the difference between making a team or making a school and, and not. You mentioned looking someone in the eye, and I know that there are times where things like that are difficult because you don't want, and, and I don't mean this to, to kind of creep people out, but there are times when it looks like you're looking at somebody in the eye and you might be staring a little too intently because you don't know how to do that because you haven't had the, the reps and the chance to do it when it comes to interpersonal communication. And that comes in a bunch of different forms, whether it's a firm handshake or, or, you know, the pat on the back, the communication, those kinds of things. And all of these little things when it comes to, to interpersonal communication can go a long way when it comes to those impressions, not just the first impression, but continuing impressions. So the folks in those positions of influence can be reminded, oh, yeah, this person, you know, they were great with a the handshake. They're, they're great. In, they're great off the field. And I'm seeing them grow on the field. And so I, I think that that's key as well is just understanding those values of communication and all those little things that can add up to a big thing that can cause some uh, adult to go, yeah, I remember that person over everyone else that doesn't respond in that way. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Because like I was just saying with Kano, dealing with things on and off the field, like the, the, the less a coach has to deal with off the field with a player, the better, right? You, you, I'd rather have a slightly less talented player who I know is going to have a good attitude, give her everything they have. And I don't have to worry about him or her and their parents off of the field. Um, then a talented player who's going to be a pain in the butt. Um, right. It's just, it's common sense for us, I think, you know, as, as older people. Um, but it's, it's difficult for kids to understand that. And I think they all, they think just, I need to be able to, I need to be the most talented. I need to have the most skills and those types of things. And, some of the other stuff goes forgotten and um, yeah, I'm trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. 
how do you turn an introvert into more of an extrovert in these situations? Because there are those that they, they just want to go out there. They want to do their job. But the the it, sometimes it might be a little bit more uncomfortable to interact with either an adult or, or other teammates. It's like, you know, hey, I'm here for you, but I'm just quiet. And that's just how I am. How do you how do you deal with those that are more introverted in this process and maybe get them out of their shell a little bit? Do you, do you ever have those kind of, uh, of interactions with your mentees? Yeah, for sure. Because I was I was pretty quiet. My for sure growing up and even as a younger pro you know didn't didn't view myself as a leader wasn't super talkative or anything like that um so there's still the ways that you can um you know perform well and act right and all those things but i also think that you know i use a couple examples and even i found one, another one last night where i was watching the new receivers show on netflix it's uh, one of those peyton manning um, produced things that follows a few wide receivers from the NFL last year. And um, Justin Jefferson was one of them. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how <clears throat> everyone that knows him uh, knows how quiet he is and really soft-spoken and doesn't like to be center of attention. Um, but he says then when he get when he puts on his chains and he puts in his gold teeth and stuff, mm-hmm. um, what do you call himself? He had another name for himself. I'm trying to think. Uh, Jets. Jets comes out. And that it's like his other personality. It's like now, now I'm the showman. Now I'm ready to go to work and, um, and have this other personality. And I talk about Joseph and Clint Dempsey. And they're really good examples of guys that are pretty chill and, and, and able to have a conversation with and hang out in the locker room. And then when they cross the line, it's it's a switch and they are just the ultimate competitor and will do whatever it takes to have success. Um, even in training against your, your own teammates. Um, and it's what made them great. And I wasn't quite like that. And I don't tell them that they have to be, but I do give these examples of, Hey, you can have a different personality on the field versus off the field. Um, and that's totally, totally fine. So then if you had a different personality on the field, like you cross the line and you have that different personality, what would you call it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Never thought about what my when, alter when, you, when you put your cape on and the alter ego goes out there and is dialing up that, that 15 handicap and shooting a low 80. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't be Jets. Um, no one, no one ever called me that in my career. Um, <laughs> Jets Parkhurst, he's out there shooting a seventy-eight. <laughs> That'll be the day. <laughs> Someday. Well, all right. So we'll we'll put that one in. So give you something to think about it. Who, what your alter ego would be? So Peter Peter Parker was uh, Peter Parker was Spider Man. Mm-hmm. And we got to figure out what Michael Parker's is, is when he when he goes out there and who he was with that alter ego. Uh, I, I do want to talk about obviously I do want to get your thoughts on Greg Berhalter before we get out of here. And since with your time with the national team. But what I also wanted to, uh, to talk about is controlling emotion. And we saw it in the uh, the Conma ball match in Charlotte where after the match of Uruguay and Colombia, which, A, on the field, controlling your emotions, uh, in international competition, calling the ball, like, stuff like that, that to me seems like it's something where you're right there on that knife edge the entire time. What's it like to be on that knife edge knowing that you do something slightly off and you really could be hurting your team. Have you had those mm-hmm. matches that you've been right there on the knife edge and in fifth gear for 90 minutes, and you're like, man, that was crazy. Have you been on that knife edge before, emotionally, trying to get something done on the field? Yeah, there are certain teams, opponents, players that really try and get under your skin, right? And we see it a lot with Central America and South American teams and players, and they're very good at it. And they understand that. Um, And this Copa America has been such a good example of the importance of controlling your emotions, right? The, in my opinion, the U S got knocked out because of, of Wea and his actions. Mm -hmm. Of course, other little things could have gone differently, 
Um, but I do think that if we played that full game, 11 v 11, we've got an 80% chance of winning that game and moving on after two games. Right. So yeah, that alone right there hurts you. And, uh, you know, I said it after it happened with Dest a couple months ago that like those things cannot happen. Um, they just can't. They, I said it at that, that, at that moment too, like that can be the difference between a world cup when you're going through and you're not, and it just happened at Copa America. And so, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, and I'm not crushing Wea here. There's other examples too, right? There's other red cards that have been in this tournament that you're like, man, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Right. Even in the Uruguay, uh, Columbia game, right. The semifinal game, right. This Uruguay player, right. Just throwing an elbow. It's like, and after, he's already- after getting pinched, he throws an elbow. Yeah. And he's already on a yellow mm-hmm. um, which could have been a straight red. Like, it's unbelievable how we see it time and time again of just unable to control yourself. And, you know, and every single time it just hurts your team, right? It just really, really hurts your team. Uruguay couldn't get over that, even though they fought hard. Um, and so they're out. And, you know, you're, you're not just, if you're being selfish to not only yourself, but the whole team. Uh, and so it's just crazy. And, we talk about little moments of being able to control your emotions because you have to build that up, right? You can't just all of a sudden be in the most high intensity situation and be expected to be able to control yourself when somebody hits you, pinches you, whatever. Um, right. It doesn't, doesn't make it right, but we all know that the person that reacts second is more likely to be caught and, um, than, than the first person, right? Even in MLS game the other day, uh, Paul Ariola throwing the ball at the guy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if I, anybody saw that, but this crowd. guy was like right in front of Pat, Paul Ariola was trying to take a throw in. So Paul just threw it right at his face and the guy reacted with violence and got a straight red. Yeah. Uh, and so again, another one where I understand you're going to be upset and you're going to have emotions because we're all human beings, but being able to control that in the most tense moment to say, Hey, this game's bigger than just me. Calm down. How can I calm down? How can I not go over the edge? When it comes to discussing this with younger athletes, do they, do they get it or do they still want to sit there and get in that shot? And it's like, oh, yeah, we'll even it up and then I'll calm down. What are, what are the conversations like these days with younger athletes? Yeah, just saying that it makes you tougher being able to control yourself than it does to go up somebody to go up to somebody and elbow them or push them. Right. Anybody can do that. Um, and I think that they're afraid sometimes of not looking tough, not being tough, getting bullied out on the field and. So I need to show that I'm strong and can react and tough and I'm not going to take this. Um, And I understand that you can do that within the game, right? You can, you can have some fouls. You can maybe even get a yellow card on a foul and stuff, but in the exact moment where everyone's looking at you is not the time to be tough, right? The tougher thing is to walk away, have a little smirk and say, Hey, I'll remember, um, Right. That that is so much tougher to do than to just react. Um, And so trying to get that through is, you know, it's it's easy for them to understand and and see it um, because we're in a nice, calm environment. um, But everyone reacts differently when they're stressed. And it's it gets to that point to where you you sit there and you're you're taking notes here it's like okay i'm gonna take a mental note here i'll I'll remember that we'll we'll have it we'll have a comeback on that later and that that i think is you know when it comes to development of younger younger players it's that making sure that you can lock in understand the context and there will be a moment later i mean like for for hockey fans i know that the the red wings and the avalanche they hated each other 
And there would be that moment where, okay, where does uh, where does Claude Lemieux get his? And they waited 371 days before Darren McCarty made an example of Claude Lemieux. So there's a time and a place for it. It's not immediate because, as you say, it's usually that second person, not the person that's trying to do the get back immediately. That's the one that gets busted and you end up doing things worse for your team. And I didn't know when I was asking if that's something that they got or if it's something that is still learned or if, if the, the younger athlete learned, knows that immediately. It's like, OK, I'll hang on to that one for later. I didn't know. Yeah. If they, if they, if they I think it. it's a learned thing because you see it on TV, but it's another thing to be involved. Right. When you're in a game and I see the DePaul comments and. You know, when they are so good, they're not only good soccer players, but they're so good at faking injuries, <laughs> getting under your skin, right? Hitting you hard, these little things, time wasting. And that stuff just builds up in a game, right? Where you get so frustrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand it because I've been there and I've seen it and witnessed it. Um, you know, so I think you have to go through it. Another one of these things where you have to experience it in order to really get it and feel your blood boil. Um, and what do you do in that moment? <laughs> I just have this vision of your alter ego and your blood boiling. Now the, you, you, you come in there. It's like, it's almost like tombstone. You, you wear the black cowboy hat. You come in, you get the big long coat and you're ready to sit there and push the doors to the saloon open. And you're ready to start, you know, taking names and things like that. <laughs> I just had this vision of you doing that now. now. Now they've got now RIFC has to film that, and they have to have that as a part of their thing. Hey, I'm not perfect either, John. I got a red card once for kicking a guy. Uh, once? Yeah, I think my only red. I got. I had two reds. One was a false identity red card. And you're going, wait a minute, bro. That wasn't me. This is before VAR. <laughs> oh, actually, I got three. Third, okay. A second one for a handball on the line, which was oh. very questionable. Oh, man. I didn't. I did not move my arms much. <laughs> I might have gave it a little chicken wing. Uh huh. Um, and the, but the, the other one was uh yeah, just got frustrated, mad. It was like second, second OT and uh, overtime and open cup game. We were, we were down, and that was that. What are we gonna do with you, man? Only three uh -huh. red cards in your career. Uh, what did you think about what happened after the match when things went completely and totally out of control? Yeah, I've read some different things where I guess the Uruguay families were over there and there was, you know, and I get that because, you know, families are a lot of times not in suites. They're just sitting in the stands. And, you know, so if they thought that their families were getting harassed or anything, I completely understand it. Um, right. That's that's a security issue that they're going to have to fix up before the World Cup. Um, so yeah, it, it, you know, I don't think it was a case of like, uh, Ron Artest at uh, the basketball yeah. game where it's no, just no malice at the palace kind yeah. of thing. So it's tough for me to judge because, you know, and if, if their families were indeed there and getting harassed then, and security wasn't handling it, then I get it. Yeah. Uh, before you go. Because uh, I know that uh, we got you for another couple of minutes. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about the coaching change that happened with uh, the men's national team. Uh, you know, we have said here on the network a lot that we are uh, we are team one cycle. That that's it. We we give me one cycle, and we're good to go. So one cycle turned into two and now Greg Berhalter is gone when this finally happened. What, uh, what went through your mind? Yeah, well, it was now or never for sure. Um, when they got knocked out and the outrage came from a lot of different groups and, and even writers and things, uh, it was done. It, he, he was gone. Um, for me is I was a little bit more because I think he's a very good coach. But I also do think that if there was a, I don't know how to say it, but if there was a different vibe or if there was a little bit of fear within the locker room or something different, I don't think the way a thing happens because 
there's just no way after the Dest incident mm -hmm. that you allow that to happen. And I know that you cannot control everyone out there, right? But, and I don't know what was said after the game when it happened to Dest or anything like that. I just know that that can't happen once, never mind twice. And if it happens twice under the same coach, then something's going, something needs to be changed because if it happens twice, then, you know, it can happen a third and a fourth and a fifth because now it's, it's okay. And uh, so that alone, right. Even tactics aside and all that, it was like, yeah, we just need new blood in there and you need to change it. And these guys have to be a little uncomfortable um, when they're in camp and, and performing for the national team. It's not just a, a comfort situation. And uh, so I'm not surprised at the move. Um, I do hope they go out there and really try and get someone um, top, top, top level. Uh, I know that there's been links to Chirundolo. Um, and for me, I don't know if he's quite ready yet. Yeah, yeah. He's, only, he's a young coach and he's done really well. Um and obviously he knows what it takes to have uh, success with the national team, but yeah, I don't know. I, I hope that we at least go for a couple other options. Um, but yeah, again, not surprised um, that it happened and probably agree with it in the end. All right. So cut the promo for me. What's going on right now with beyond goals and with what you and Greg are up to and with what you're up to, man, I've been, cutting a ton of video lately because we had a lot of great feedback and success with the the um webinars that we did with uh different video clips and stuff so now we've got a different project <clears throat> lined up um so I, i'm cutting clips of mls nwsl national team games just so many different um instances and so that'll be a tool soon um uh, for players to use to to grow their knowledge of the game and um it's it's a great way to learn and get better without having to run around and uh exert a lot of physical energy the webinar with michael parkhurst and greg garza cap as always it's great to catch up with you get your feedback on how things are going with uh, dealing with mentees and what they're tackling and what adults tackle when they're being surrounded by younger adults as well. Uh, get out of here, my friend, and we will catch up with you soon. Thanks for dropping by as you always do. Of course. Have a great weekend.